thinking that life has passed them by. All right, so now we start our chapter on Exodus, our lecture on Exodus. And I chose the song Lonely People because that's really how Exodus begins with um, just people in despair. Um, they feel like God has abandoned them. They've been enslaved for 400 years. And, you know, we ended Exodus, or Genesis, sorry, on a relatively good note um, with the wonderful events of the story of Joseph and his rise to power, and that through that, God was able to provide for God's people and um, just some good things, so many good things happening. And then we begin Exodus, and a lot has gone wrong. So let's dive into this lecture. So the author of Exodus, as with all of the Pentateuch, this is attributed to Moses. I talked about this in the lecture on Genesis with definitely help from editors and other contributors, probably put into final written form sometime during the time of the kings. Now the dating of Exodus we're going to talk about in a couple of slides because this is a point of contention among scholars. The genre of Exodus is mostly historiography. This is, again, just continuing that story of how God's people came to be. But there's also some lists included. There's a song or a poem in chapter 15. So there's some um, other genres within this history. Exodus continues the story of God's redemption of the world. But now that family that we met in Genesis is going to be replaced by a nation. So it's not just going to be one family. It's going to be an entire people group that becomes part of the story. So the structure of Exodus is sort of interesting to note. The first 15 chapters deal with the liberation of God's people. This is the story of Moses leading the people out of Egypt, and it is central and crucial to the Israelite faith. Exodus will be referred to in every other book of the Old Testament. And for most of us, again, those of us who may be familiar with some of the stories of the Bible or those of us who have engaged in deeper Bible study before, um, this is the part of Exodus that is very familiar to us. Again, uh, the story of Moses leading the people out of Egypt is one that appears in popular culture. Movies have been made about it. But most of Exodus is about the rest of the story. That's not even half of Exodus. Uh, the rest of it is about God forming these people that come out of Egypt into a nation. And so it's also crucial, but it's sort of less focused on because, let's face it, it gets a little boring. It gets a little repetitive. I tried to cut out a lot of that in your readings so that you didn't have to just reread the same instructions for how to build the tabernacle because it just makes your eyes cross. So in chapter 16 through 40, we talk about Moses a lot. Again, um, Moses really is a precursor to Jesus, sort of helping us understand some things about what we're going to discover about Jesus. Moses hands down the law. Um, God gives it to him in the form of the Ten Commandments, but also the Mosaic Law. We see another covenant, the Mosaic Covenant formed, and of course we see the building of the tabernacle. So the dating of Exodus. Now we are in dateable history. We're no longer in that primeval history that we saw in Genesis. So when did all of this happen? Well, there's several different ideas for this in scholarship. I'm going to focus in on sort of the two main ideas. So the first one calls for a later dating, that the actual exodus happened sometime in the beginning of the 13th century, between 1300 and 1250 BC. What proof of there, or, or what evidence points to this? Well, uh, a big one is the discovery of what's called the Merneptah Stel. This is an Egyptian monument that on its, you know, stone face states that Merneptah subdued several people groups in the land of Canaan, including Israel, in his fifth year of power, circa 1209 BC. Uh, thus, the exodus would have had to take place before this because, of course, the people had to get out of Egypt and into the land of Canaan. 
And so the fact that he's recognizing this nation Israel is, you know, testimony to Israel has been in existence and so therefore needed to come out of Egypt before the date of 1209. Now just a caveat here, this was a, a common thing in the ancient Near East where these rulers would claim that they had subdued and conquered people groups. Not always true. Um, they might have had skirmishes, but sometimes they'd say, you know, I completely eradicated the people called Israel. Well, obviously that's not true because Israel continues to exist. So just take that with a grain of salt. What's interesting is not what he's actually saying, but the fact that he's acknowledging that Israel existed as a nation, which means that it had to have been formed before 1209. In Exodus 1.11, we read that the Israelites built the store cities of Pithom and Ramses, uh, these are named after Egyptian rulers. Ramses II built the city of Ramses in the mid-13th century. Thus, the exodus would have had to take in place after he ascended to the throne. He ascended to the throne sometime around 1300 BC. And so again, um, you know, this argues for a later dating, somewhere around 1250. Now, another camp argues for an earlier dating that people came out of Egypt sometime in 1450 BC. Uh, that's like a 200 year difference. Why is there a difference? Well, because of the dating in the Bible. So in 1 Kings 6.1, we read 480 years after Exodus, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign, Solomon began to build the temple. That then, if we count back from Solomon's reign, which we can date, um, Exodus would have been somewhere around 1440 BC. But in Exodus 1240, we read that Israel was in Egypt for 430 years. We believe Israel went to Egypt between the 18th century and 1550 BC. Thus, that again would argue that the Exodus occurred sometime later in the 13th century. So I tend to be one of the ones that argues for that later dating that Exodus happened somewhere around 1250 BC. But uh, this is again an area where we can disagree and there's kind of evidence in both camps. I will say uh, an asterisk here, dating in the Bible is always problem problematic as are numbers. They just don't treat numbers and dating quite the same way that we do, especially in the more ancient portions of the text. So just kind of keep that in mind. Archaeological findings. Um, what do these tell us about the dating? Well, it provides a very complex picture of what happened in the Exodus. So late Bronze Age was between 1550 and 1200, and then Iron One was 1200 to 1000. Um, during this transition, there is a surge of population by what's called pastoral peoples, and they um, come into the area, the land of Canaan, in small regional settlements. So it's not like two million people descend upon this region. That would have that would be pretty um, easy to back up archaeologically. You would think that we would find evidence of like a giant group of people coming through. A giant group of people like that would have overwhelmed Canaan because the way, and we'll talk about this more in Joshua, but the geography of the land didn't support like two million people living together. Uh, you could, it just, it's mountain, mountainous. Um, it's just, it's not possible. So it's not like Egypt where, you know, it's a, it's a little bit flatter and easier maybe to have a bunch of people living together. So we'll, again, we'll talk about this when we get to Joshua, but there's evidence that suggests that, you know, an exodus did happen, but not like a giant group of people, like maybe the Bible depicts. Um, but even the Bible kind of, I think, has some evidence of a slower migration. So in, in Deuteronomy 7, 22, I'm going to try to quickly turn to that. Seven twenty two through 23, it says, The Lord your God will drive out those nations before you little by little. You will not be allowed to eliminate them all at once, or the wild animals will multiply around you. But the Lord your God will deliver them over to you. So that is telling, again, of like slower migration. God's saying, like, you can't all at once do this, or it's just going to overwhelm the land. Um, it, it, the land will not be able to support everybody all living together at once. So 
when again we'll talk about when we get to Joshua sort of the implications of this another archaeological finding there's evidence of a settlement at Bethel um, this was built on top of a destroyed Canaanite site this is very common that they would destroy one you know people group inhabiting in a place and they would just build right on top of it often because those places were near water and so it wasn't like I'm gonna destroy this city and go start another city like no I need to be near water so I'm just gonna build on top of it and then um, there's some settlements perhaps at Tel Beir, Mirsim, Tel Zoror, Beth Shemesh and um, there's also evidence that the city of Hazor was entirely leveled to the ground. Um, so there's evidence of destruction and settlements um, but this is occurring over a span of two centuries. Again, you know, they aren't finding evidence that every single city in Canaan was destroyed all at the same time because two million people entered in. Again, we'll talk more about this with Joshua, but just kind of understand that it's a complex picture. It's not a simple thing to say, well, we think the Israelites left Egypt in, you know, 1300 and got to Canaan in 1250. Like it's just, it's hard to pinpoint exactly these dates. So what are the themes of Exodus? Uh, deliverance and redemption is a huge one. Um, again, we have this, this accounting of how Israel was saved and brought out of Egypt, delivered from their slavery. Uh, creation of a people group dedicated to God. That's the second half, as I talked about. And especially with the purpose in Exodus 19, we'll look at that in a minute. And then so much of Exodus is a revelation of God's nature and character. So we've seen that in um, Genesis, God is creator, God is, you know, provider for the people, but really the focus there is on God as, as creator, God is sovereign, God's calling people to follow him, etc. Now we're going to get a little more personal, if you will, if you can say that about God. Um, God's going to reveal God's name. In Exodus 3, 14 through 15, um, that's the Hebrew for you. You would read that right to left instead of left to right. Um, and it's unpronounceable because that has the, those aren't any uh, vowels there. Um, it, it's all consonants. So it's written, if we transliterate it, Y-H-W-H. -H, and you'll often hear that said Yahweh. But really, there, we're like putting vowels where there aren't vowels in there. It was meant to be unpronounceable because they thought that, God, that God's name was so holy that no person should be able to say it. So they called God Adonai. Um, and in fact, when I take classes, um, when I've taken my advanced Hebrew classes, we're not allowed to say Yahweh. <laughs> we have to, when we see those letters right there that you're seeing, um, we have to say Adonai because that's considered most respectful because God's name is so holy. Um, you'll also hear sometimes Jehovah. This is a German um, iteration of that concept of Adonai. So Jehovah, Jehovah, Adonai, um, you'll hear Yahweh too. God's, uh, we also learn about God's concern for people. We saw this in Genesis. We'll continue to see his care and concern for his people. Um, we learn a lot about God's justice, God's patience. <laughs> That's going to come true through the rest of the Pentateuch because we'll see him deal with these stubborn Israelites. Um, God's power to redeem, God's power in general, especially in the um, story of the plagues, God's provision. Um, providing of manna and water, God's use of ordinary people. We saw that. That's going to continue in Exodus with Moses and Aaron. God's glory um, in, in the ending of Exodus and just um, God revealing God's glory to Moses. And yes, God's grace. Um, if you are a Christian, if you've studied the Bible before, you might think of grace as a concept that really belongs in the New Testament with Jesus Christ. But grace is everywhere. God is a God of grace. God is the same God. The Old Testament God and the New Testament God are one God. And so we see grace even here in Exodus. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So who is Moses? He's the central character. He is the one that, you know, we attribute the authorship of the first five books of the Bible. And here in Exodus, we are introduced to him. So Moses is born into a time when the Israelites are oppressed. They're suffering. They have become enslaved to Egypt. The Bible tells us that 
um, all the goodness that happened with Joseph, that generation died. And so in verse 7, it says the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful, multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, became so numerous that the land was filled with them. And then in verse 8, then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. So they have fallen out of favor and into slavery. And it is brutal. Um, their lives are said to be bitter. The Egyptians work them ruthlessly and all their harsh labor. The Egyptians work them ruthlessly twice. They repeat that phrase. So you know that things are really bad. Um, and it's so bad that Pharaoh gets just completely ticked off because the Israelites continue to multiply no matter how oppressed they are. And so he says to the Hebrew midwives, if you see a baby boy, kill him only let the girls live. And so he's trying to wipe out these people. Um, but the midwives, yay, God bless these women, fear God. And they do not do what the king of Egypt tells them to, and they let the little boys live. And then when the king of Egypt says to them, what, have you, what, what are you doing? Why are these boys alive? They say, well, these women are just, they're, you know, they're not like Egyptian women. They're very vigorous, and they give birth before the midwives can arrive. And so we read that God is kind to these midwives and Israel continues to increase in number. So bless those faithful midwives. We don't even know their names, but or no, we do, don't we? Yes, Shifra and Pua. Bless Shifra and Pua. What awesome women of faith they were. And there's so much in that. I could preach a whole sermon on those two and what they teach us. So Moses is spared. He's raised in Pharaoh's household. Um, he's adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. Uh, clearly, God is preparing Moses for something, but Moses is a human, and so he makes a mistake. He um, engages in what we might call today manslaughter, um, murdering the the Egyptian or the murdering. Um, bah, I can't talk. The murder of the altercation that he finds. Um, he it, this is in verse 11 of chapter 2. It says, After Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them with their labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, and so he kills the Egyptian and hides him in the sand. And then from that, um, all manner of badness breaks out, and so Moses is forced to flee, and he ends up wandering in the desert, which also becomes a time of preparation for him. He kind of settles he marries, um, he becomes, you know, a farmer, a shepherd, and really far away from the roots where he was raised. Um, and then he is called. And so we have the story of the Moses and the burning bush in chapter three, it's such an important story. Um, this is where God reveals God's name. And so find and then Moses leads the people. He becomes the leader of this nation, and we see him grow in this leadership role. And that will be true as we continue to read um, in Numbers as well. And so at first, Moses is, you know, a very unlikely leader, right? He murdered someone. He had to flee. He's been living, you know, away from his people. And he stutters. He's, he's a human. He's imperfect. And so God calls him to this and he's like, I don't know about this God. Like, don't you know who I am? I'm a stutterer. Like, there's just no way I can do it. And God is very kind and generous and full of grace in these encounter, early encounters with Moses. And we'll see as Moses grows in his leadership and his faith that he becomes an intercessor. We'll see this in the story of the golden calf. And God's going to hold him to a higher account as he matures in his faith. And so we'll talk about this when we get to Moses' story in Numbers. So Moses is going to become the leader against which every other Israelite leader king, queen, whatever, will be measured for the rest of time. Um, Moses is the, the character of the Old Testament, the person that, um, just like the Exodus is their, you know, the event to which they will always come back to, they also always come back to the person of Moses. He's so important to um, the Old Testament. So uh, after Moses is called, and there's so much in that burning bush story, I wish I could focus in on it, but, you know, just 
that's where God reveals his name I am who I am and so then after Moses gets called and he goes back and his, he's gonna be the one to lead the people out of Egypt and so we learn about Pharaoh and in chapter 5 verse 2 he says who is the Lord who is the Lord picture of saying this with like just the most obnoxious voice who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go I do not know the Lord and I will not let Israel go that's fighting words to say to the God of the universe like I don't know him he's nothing to me and I am not gonna do what this God says so obviously God's going to respond to that and he answers Pharaoh in no uncertain terms like there is no questioning who God is when God is done with Pharaoh now one of the difficulties in reading the story of Pharaoh is the language around the hardening of his heart um, you'll see it a lot a lot in this encounter and you might wonder what is going on I thought God gave us free will and you are right God does give us free will and so you're gonna rightly ask well then why is he hardening Pharaoh's heart that doesn't seem like free will that seems like God's forcing Pharaoh to not you know recant and repent and turn to God um, so in Hebrew there are three different ways this term is used there's actually like different verb conjugations and so it changes the meaning so what we in English read as the hardening of Pharaoh's heart means three different things in the Hebrew so number one Pharaoh hardens his own heart and that's the first things we see like as this phrase is showing up the very first times we see this phrase Pharaoh's doing it to himself he's making his own heart hard how do we do that we're stubborn we're bitter we're greedy uh, we refuse to be humble we can harden our own hearts I think we know that to be true the second use is Pharaoh's heart is hardened but it's like a generalized description like just a passive way of saying you know describing what's been happening Pharaoh's heart is being hardened the third way indeed does say that God hardens Pharaoh's heart but there's some important nuance to what this means this only happens after Pharaoh already has done so himself so we've been reading Pharaoh's hardening his own heart Pharaoh's heart is hardened and then we read God hardens Pharaoh's heart so what this means is that he's not hardening the heart of someone who is innocent he's not hardening the heart of a person who at some point would have gone you know what I'm wrong God is the God of the universe I'm so sorry I repent I follow you now no Pharaoh never would have done that God knows Pharaoh God knows Pharaoh's heart God knows each one of our hearts and so God knows the outcome and God knows that Pharaoh is never gonna choose God Pharaoh made that clear in verse in chapter 5 too. <laughs> who is this Lord I don't know him and I'm not gonna do what he asks and that is never gonna change that is always going to be Pharaoh's response to God and so God is going to complete a process that Pharaoh only already started and use it for good God's going to use Pharaoh's stubbornness and opposition for God's own purposes and in fact he's gonna lead many people you know what what he does here with Pharaoh is gonna cause many people to come to God not just Israelites but Egyptians are gonna come out of Egypt and become part of this family of Israel so God is using Pharaoh's stubbornness to to enact this plan and so it's not like God again not hardening the heart of an, an innocent person not picking a baby up and saying you know I'm gonna make you be bad for my own purposes but just completing what he already knows is gonna happen so that God can in fact save many other lives so what follows are plagues ten plagues uh, the first nine we can divide into sort of sets of three and then the tenth plague is kind of in its own category because it's so horrible so the first three plagues water becomes um, blood the frogs and the mosquitoes and the gnats notice that everybody is affected by these Egyptians Israelites everybody um, also notice that the Egyptian magicians are able to recreate these plagues themselves like that you know Moses turns the water into blood but then the Egyptian magician can do the same thing but they can't 
end them. They can't stop the plagues. Only God or Moses, you know, as God's hands and feet can put a stop to the plagues. <clears throat> then the second group are the flies, the cattle dying, and the boils. Um, here, God's people are not affected, only the people that don't believe in God. And so I don't even just say the Egyptians, because at this point, there are Egyptians that are coming into the Israelite camp and saying, like, I believe that God is God. I reject Pharaoh. I'm going to live as an Israelite now. So whoever claims to have faith in God are not affected by these three. And these three really have to do with like aspects of, of Egyptian worship. Um, the, the cattle they would have used in worship boils on the people. Then the next three are kind of environmental, right? We've got hail, locusts, and darkness. Again, God's people are not affected. So anyone that claims to have faith in God is not affected by these plagues. Only those who are still in opposition to God. And then finally, we have the slaying of the firstborn, which is um, also the Passover. God's people are not affected. Anyone that believed in God, not affected. Again, only people that are rejecting God. And yes, this is a horrible, awful plague. The, the thought that all these Egyptian baby boys have died is awful. But, <laughs> but, if we can say but, this is nuanced. They had nine other plagues in which to realize like God is God and we better follow him and not listen to Pharaoh anymore. There was opportunity to turn away and turn to God. And so as horrible as it is, this punishment um, only came on the people that refused, refused to profess faith in God. So I said this um, just now, but the plagues confront either aspects of Egyptian worship or their deities, their gods and goddesses. And so you can read through this list on your own and kind of see which god or goddess or aspect of worship it um, opposes. So what do these plagues tell us about God? Well, they answer Pharaoh's question, don't they? <laughs> Who is this God? Uh, god responds, I am God of the universe and I have the power to do anything, anything. Uh, so God shows his power. They also become a testimony to future generations. The, this story is going to be told over and over again. I mean, I'm sure this was a favorite at the campfire, right? Oh, mom and dad, tell me the story of the plagues and how Moses led the people out of Egypt. And we'll see this when we get to the book of Joshua. We'll see that, um, that uh, these two Israelites encounter a woman named Rahab, who tells them, well, this whole land of Canaan knows the story of what happened in Egypt. <clears throat> they, uh, through the plagues, God is able to judge the false little g gods and demons of the Egyptian religion, and he's able to show them to be absolutely worthless in, in terms of God's power. They become, again, a warning, not just a testimony to future generations, but also a warning. Um, hey, you know, you should believe in God too. They become a testimony of God's greatness to Israel. So as Israel encounters difficulties and hardships in its nationhood, they're going to be able to look back in this and say, but God led us out of Egypt. And so God will save us again. And they become a chance for repentance and redemption. Again, more people than just Israel comes out of Egypt. There's also Egyptians. It's really kind of a ragtag group of people that Moses leads across the Red Sea. Um, not just Israel, but a lot of different people. Everyone who's hungering for um, just what God has to offer. And so we see that redemption is possible even in the Old Testament. And then I put here that faith needs something to see and touch. And that's what the celebration of the Passover becomes. So just like with the covenants, there's always a physical sign. You know, we've got circumcision, we've got the rainbow. Faith needs that too. We need physical things because our faith is based on things that we cannot see. And so the celebration of the Passover becomes the central remembrance of Israelite faith. Just as the Exodus is the central event of their faith, the Passover is the central remembrance. It's that physical thing to engage in, to remind themselves that this happened, that God rescued them, that God brought them out of slavery and into the promised land, and that God will continue to do that in our lives. And we're also going to see uh, next week when we look at Leviticus, other festivals and feasts, 
as well as the entire sacrificial system becomes this something to see and touch for the Old Testament faith. So what is the Passover? <clears throat> well, this is the beginning of the Jewish calendar. Jewish people continue to practice the Passover to this day. It usually aligns very closely with Easter because the events of Jesus' crucifix crucifixion and resurrection happen during the Jewish Passover. And so in our current calendar times, often Passover kind of is very close to when we would celebrate Easter as Christians. Um, the symbols of the Passover, the lamb, this is going to become important when we talk about uh, Jesus Christ, because he is the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. Just as at, at Passover, they partake of a lamb that has no blemish. The blood on the doorway. So the people are to put blood on the tops and the sides of their doorway so that the angel of death will pass them by. Uh, that's why it's called the Passover. And um, the way the dory was, kind of that cross, you know, there's a blood across and a horizontal and there's blood in a vertical, just kind of hearkens to the cross where Jesus will die on the cross. And because of that, um, all of us who claim faith in Christ will be passed over by the angel of death because we will be in eternity. More on that when we get to the New Testament. But anyway, just understand that these events that are happening in the Passover point us forward to Jesus Christ on the cross. They're very significant in understanding what Jesus did for us on the cross. <clears throat> so then we get to Mount Sinai. So God enters into a covenant relationship with Israel. So look at uh, Exodus chapter 19. Um, so it says in verse 3, Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him and said, this is what you are say, to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So this is what we're going to call the Mosaic Covenant. Now there are stipulations. So whereas in the Abrahamic Covenant, God took the oath completely upon himself. You know, <clears throat> if this covenant fails, may I be torn in two. Now the people are going to become bound by some stipulations. Notice verse 5, if you obey me and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. So they're going to be God's people, God's nation, God's chosen people. But in order to keep that status, they've got to uphold the covenant. And the purpose of this is missional. You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. God is not just choosing these people just for the sake of choosing people, but God wants these people to then take the name of God and the glory of God out into the world and make God's name known. So we're going to have as more detailed stipulations to this, the Ten Commandments and the Mosaic Law. Um, these are rules, things that they have to uphold, but they're also anchored in grace. So like the Ten Commandments, for instance, are ways to love God and love one another so that you can live in community and in relationship again. They're a means to restoring that broken relationship that happened in the Garden of Eden. So uh, whereas in the New Testament, we're going to talk about Jesus being the means of restoring the relationship. Here in the Old Testament, it's the law. If you live by these rules, then you are my people and you are this nation of priests and you get the blessing of being used by me to make my, my name known in the rest of the world. Now, when it comes to the law and the commandments, it gets confusing here in Exodus. There's multiple accounts. Um, things get out of order. I've cut a lot of that out for you in the reading, but just know that if you were to read the whole thing, you'd be reading, you know, the the um, Ten Commandments get handed down like more than once because of events that happen. We learn a lot about community here in the Mount Sinai events, um, about the laws and rules that are meant to keep unity and peace, the importance of working together and helping one another. Um, this is not an individualistic faith. This was not an individualistic 
time. This concept can be really hard for us to grasp because especially those of us who live in sort of western parts of the world, especially America, we're like, you know, it's can do, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, be independent, earn your own way in life, um, make it, you know, make a way for yourself. And there's less of this idea of the generations. I find that to be um, this concept of generational and community is more true in like some of um, Asian cultures or Middle Eastern cultures or even South American cultures where like you'll find whole generations of families that live together. It's just less so in the Western world. We're kind of this idea of being independent is upheld as like such an important thing. So it's sometimes hard for us to grasp this. But here in the very beginning, as Israel is becoming a nation, God is saying like, you need one another. You cannot do this alone. And so we see this not just in the way that the laws are designed, but in Jethro's advice to Moses. Remember his father-in-law comes and says like, dude, you are on the brink of burnout. You have got to start delegating. And so Moses does. Um, we see this on the beautiful, I love this part where Aaron and her hold up Moses' arms. Um, there's a battle going on and it's as long as Moses is holding up his arms, everything's okay. But when he drops his arms, um, the, the Israelites start to lose. And so we see that, um, again, this idea of community. And then the people come together to build the tabernacle and they all contribute to it. They contribute the means to make the tabernacle. And then some of the artisans contribute to the actual making of the tabernacle. And then a different group of people contribute to the upkeep, to the responsibility of moving the tabernacle when they journey from place to place. So the tabernacle is the, is where God's presence is going to be located. It is a visible symbol of God living in the community. And so there's rules and regulations for the people, especially as the tabernacle is concerned. We'll talk about this more next week when we talk about the sacrificial system in Leviticus. But the tabernacle becomes the means by which God can live amongst the people and the people can live with God. So remember that question we asked in Genesis. How do we get back to the Garden of Eden? How do we get back to being in communion with God the way that Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden? This is um, this is the beginning of that process, the tabernacle. God's going to live in the tabernacle. There's going to be rules about it because it's not, you know, we're not back to Eden fully yet. That's not going to come. That can't come until Jesus. But this is going to be a way for God to once again be with God's people. Um, we learn about the priest system here. I'm going to talk more about this next week as well because it comes up again in Leviticus with all, sort of all the rules and rituals regarding them. But Aaron, uh, Moses' brother, and his sons are tapped to be the priestly leaders of Israel. It's quite a lengthy ordination process. I'm really glad that uh, we don't have to do that in this day and time. But, and again, I'll talk more about that next week. So there's some issues that confront the people of Israel. <laughs> the lack of faith and trust of God. We see this right away. They get out of Egypt. They cross the Red Sea. They've seen this amazing way that God has delivered them. And they start complaining almost instantly. And then they keep complaining. And they complain some more. Um, and then we see the incident of the golden calf in Exodus 32 and the aftermath of it in Exodus 33. Uh, I love this story. When God, uh, Moses and, you know, God says, what happened? And Aaron's like, oh, I just happened to throw in some gold and this calf, po calf popped out of the fire. Uh, a lot of blame and shame going on here in this story. Um, but it really what becomes important is not just that the people mess up because that's human nature, but the way in which Moses intercedes for the people. Um, and that happens, you know, God they meet and talk and God's like, that's it. I'm starting over with you, Moses. I'm wiping all these people out and we're going to start again. And Moses says, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Because to do that is going to, you know, you're a holy God and it's going to bring dishonor on you. And just don't do this. He says, why should your anger burn against your people who you brought out of Egypt? Why should Egyptians say it was with evil intent that God brought them out to kill them in the mountains? Turn from your fierce anger, God. Relent and do not bring disaster on your people. So it's like to your glory, God, that you don't do this because then everybody else is going to look and go, oh, well, he saved the people only to kill them. So like, why would we ever follow that God? So, um, 
Moses intercedes and God responds to this intercession. And it makes like, it, it's wonderful to read and also confounding and also maybe even a little scary. Like God changes his mind because Moses prays. Like what if Moses hadn't prayed? Would God have wiped out all those people? What is going on here? Does God really change his mind? Um, you know, there is something to be said about prayer. There's relationship there. Um, we pray for things that they don't always come true or we don't always see them come true or it seems sometimes like God doesn't respond. But that is the language of our relationship with God is prayer, uniting us, bringing us closer to God's will. So there's so much more I could say about this. And let's let's talk about this in uh, our Zoom class because there's more to be said. But I've, I've got to wrap up. This lecture is long and I've got to go pick up my daughter. So we're wrapping up. Uh, so we also see a renewal of the covenant, a repeating of the tabernacle instructions. Um, after this event happens, they redo it. <laughs> God, once again, kind of hands down the commandments. The tabernacle instructions are repeated. It's like a starting over. Um, God also, look at, look at these verses, go back and look at them. God says a lot about himself here, declaring himself to be, you know, full of compassion and mercy, um, a lot, a lot to say. So those are passages to pay, pay attention to. Um, and so we see in the Exodus that God desires to live amongst them. The questions, how does God live among a sinful people when God is so holy and perfect? God's pure and perfect presence is unbearable to an unclean people. I will talk more about what I mean by this next week, um, and we can talk about it again in our Zoom class. So in the Old Testament, God lives amongst the people via the law. The law is the means by which um, God can safely come amongst the people. In the New Testament, it's relationship. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. So Exodus ends with God coming to live amongst the people. There's this amazing moment where he descends into the tabernacle, and it's a huge moment for Israel and for everyone. You know, we're not back to Eden, but we're getting there. God is living amongst the people again, living amongst this specific people who are supposed to be this missional people that are going to go out and make God known to the rest of the world. So I'm going to let you look at these yourself, and we can talk about them if you have any questions in the Zoom class, but there's lots of symbolism going on in the tabernacle and the way it links to Jesus Christ in the New Testament. The same with the order in which the tabernacle is set up, and then Jesus' I am statements that we find in the Gospel of John. Um, and then some words about the Pentateuch, the law, or not the Pentateuch, the law, Torah. Sometimes you'll hear the law divided into sort of three categories. These are human categories that scholars have made to help us make sense of the law and like which parts of the law still apply to us in our modern day times. So there's moral law that is said to be based on God's nature. These laws make sense. They are reasonable. They are unchanging. Thou shall not kill. Like, yes, that makes sense. Murder is bad. Murder is always going to be bad. Um, that's not going to change even when Jesus Christ comes. Like, in fact, he's going to say there's even more to it than that. Um, so the Ten Commandments, we might say, are moral law. Now, uh, this is especially prescient in these days and times for the Methodist Church. But there's disagreement over the laws on human sexuality. Some people say that those are moral laws that do not change, that don't change even when Jesus comes in the New Testament. Some people say, no, those laws actually can be reinterpreted once Jesus Christ arrives. Um, so as you know, probably, especially if you know anything about the Methodist Church or some other denominations, there's a lot of um, back and forth going on about human sexuality. It's not the only reason, but it's the one that the media has picked up on. The church is probably about to split. And um, again, it's not the only reason that the church is splitting. It's the thing that the media picks up on, but it is a big one and it's pointing to some other things. And we'll talk about that more when we get to the New Testament. Then there's ceremonial laws. These are laws related to worship, um, all the things about, you know, Aaron and his sons and how they had to prepare sacrifices. No longer relevant in New Testament times. We're going to learn that Jesus fulfills the law he completely fulfills these. We don't have to worry about the sacrificial system anymore. Praise the Lord. 
Then there's judicial laws. These are given for a specific time and place. These are the laws of government. These are, you know, things very specific to the people living in the Old Testament times. Again, no longer really relevant to us. For example, we don't have to follow the law not to wear more than two types of cloth in one garment. Um, that actually was a law that spoke to a pagan practice, and that's why it was important for their time to differentiate themselves from the pagans does not apply to us in modern day times. So yes, these laws have been fulfilled in Christ. They no longer apply to our daily lives. But you know, then there's things like the Ten Commandments, which do still apply because Christ does not negate that it is bad to murder. Christ does not negate that we only are to worship one true God. But even the laws that we don't need to adhere to anymore, they are still useful because they can help us understand God's care and concern, the ways God provided for God's people, the ways God set God's people apart, which is still something that applies to us who believe, those who follow Christ. We are still called to be set apart from the rest of the world. More on that in the New Testament. So it all is useful for our instruction, even if we don't have to follow all of those Mosaic laws. So in the New Testament, we'll talk about Jesus fulfills the law and in fact moves beyond the law to heart and mind and intention and motive. We who believe in Jesus Christ are called to be holy and follow in his footsteps. What exactly does that mean? We will find out. But let me say, hint, hint, not necessarily easier. Like we'll talk about that when we talk about what does it mean to murder. New Testament coming soon. So difficulties in reading, um, pretty much everything that happens after the golden calf incident. Um, in Exodus 32, Moses commands the people to kill the ones who did not repent after this. Very violent and bloody and awful. Um, let's talk about that in our Zoom class if you have questions. We're really going to hit on this issue when we get to the book of Joshua um, and kind of what are we are to do with these commands from God to kill people and how do we how do we reconcile that with the God that we know loves people and is a God of grace? Like, how do those two things go together? Because we know that God is God. God is God. Old Testament, New Testament, all of it. It's the same God. So we have got to start to um, learn to, to wrestle with these tensions in an appropriate way. So let's talk about that in Zoom class. And so again, these are questions to ask yourself. What do I learn about God in Exodus? What do I learn about God's mission? Interesting, isn't it, that we learn that God created Israel to have a missional purpose. Um, that didn't just start with Jesus Christ either. The, the, the intention for Israel was to make God's name known to the rest of the world. And then for us in this time, in 2022, how does Exodus equip us to participate in the mission of God? So that's the end of our slideshow. Um, bring your questions to Zoom class. I can't wait to talk with all of you there. Also feel free to email me your questions and we can kind of have a back and forth. Um, if I think your question is one that a lot of people are going to have, I will bring it up in Zoom and I will make sure to uh, record our Tuesday Zoom so that if you have to miss but you had a question, you can um, see how that gets answered in Zoom class. But lots to talk about. I also have a list of study questions. You do not have to do the study questions. They are completely optional, but they are a way for you kind of to engage in this material more. And if you take a look at those questions, there's some things in there that we can talk about in Zoom. And then any other questions you have that I didn't address, please feel free to bring those to our Zoom class. If you can give me a heads up, that's helpful because I can know what I need to answer beforehand, but you don't have to. All right, uh, let me close with prayer. Gracious God, thank you so much for this time together, this time to learn about you and your word, wherever we stand in our faith, God, whether it's fully in, um, we love Bible study, or we're just starting the journey, or we're not sure, and we, we, we don't even know yet what we believe. God, I just pray for everybody that you would come alongside them, that they would be equipped and encouraged and find um, new insight and meaning as they study. I pray for safety for everyone in this class, for our families and our wider circles. God, be with all of us in these tumultuous times and help us to be more kind and more loving um, to everyone we encounter. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Love you all. I will see you next week.